Our first keynote is David Kay, the director of the International Justice Clinic at University of California, Irvine School of Law, and the UN Special Rapporteur on the pr Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. David Kay began his legal career with the US State Department, working on international claims, nuclear nonproliferation, international humanitarian law, and accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The Human Rights Council appointed Professor Kay rapporteur in August of last year, and he wasted little time in addressing timely and complex issues. He released his first report on the use of encryption and anonymity to exercise the rights to freedom of opinion and expression in the digital age in May. In the report, Professor Kay stressed that encryption and anonymity protect privacy and enable the exercise of human rights, including freedom of expression and opinion online. Professor Kay specifically addressed some of the critical questions under discussion here today. He called on states to avoid measures that weaken the security of individuals, address challenges with key escrow, and noted that encryption backdoors disproportionately affect all online users. Ladies and gentlemen, David Kay. Thank you. So I don't see anybody. I'm just assuming that that wasn't like a, you know, like a laugh track on uh, <laughs> that. Uh, so I, I'm assuming you're there. Um, I'm really sorry not to be with you there in Washington, given how terrific the program looks. Uh, and I first want to thank everyone at Access, especially Amy, for organizing the Crypto Summit, but really everyone who, as always with Access, has played a, a critical role. Um, so I can't start actually without a shout out to Access, which has been a critical supporter of my work uh, since I began nearly a year ago, and of course, uh, a, a great supporter of the work of my predecessor, Frank LaRue. Uh, I was actually a digital neophyte, uh, or digital security neophyte, uh, until a the Access team helped set me up with GPG and Thunderbird last year. And uh, now I'm an active user, as are all of my students at UC Irvine. And um, the last panel, which I was able to catch parts of it, seem to be highlighting uh, usability problems, which we've encountered, but, but of course you only resolve usability problems with more use. Uh, so by now you've had a fully programmed day and I was kind of wondering how I can keep you awake, especially when you have this big head on a screen in front of you, uh, and also just what I could add to what the brilliant speakers and participants, that is you, have undoubtedly already said and have been talking about. So. Um, so I thought I would try to do three things. Um, first, I'll say a few words of introduction about the job I have, although I assume most of you know a little bit about the UN system. But let me talk a little bit about that and about why we pursued encryption and anonymity as subjects for a first report. Second, I want to identify some, port, some points from that first report to the Human Rights Council. Um, and I'll also say something about how governments responded to the report when I presented it in Geneva last month. And then third, I'd like to say just a, a few short closing words about the way forward on, uh, on the international front. But before I do that, I, I really wanted to start with a word of advocacy for the perspective I'm bringing here today and that I believe many, if not all of you share. So I believe that the resonance domestically, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom in particular, on these issues, encryption and anonymity and digital security generally, the resonance has been in part because of economic and privacy concerns brought about by weakened encryption. And that makes total sense in terms of history and economic reality. But I wanna encourage people to think not only in those terms, but also in terms of the impact weak digital security would have on global commitments to freedom of opinion and expression and a wide range of other rights that really depend upon freedom of opinion and expression. So that includes a widely held commitment to freedom of expression in this country, but also the support for democratic and human rights activists worldwide, the support for a free press, the support for others who are simply seeking uh, to gain access to information around the world. The language of human rights, and in particular freedom of opinion and expression, is a language to which people around the world respond, and it applies as much as economic and privacy rights in the case of encryption and anonymity. 
So that's been my goal since we, la we launched the research for this project last fall, uh, that is to, to try to focus attention on questions of human rights and to balance in a way the focus which in the US and the UK has been really on uh, the negative sides that might be uh, at issue with encryption and anonymity. Um, and it's a goal that I hope we can all sort of achieve or aim towards as we move together forward. Okay, so I assume you're all there. Oh, I see you now, okay. Because um, that would be really weird if I were sitting in my house for 10 minutes talking to, to nobody. It happens, it happens. And, and if my dog gets involved here, that'll, that'll be fine. Okay, so let me start with some background. Um, and I wanna start with just a very short background note. So as I'm sure you know, uh, the UN's Human Rights Council appoints so-called special rapporteurs to monitor particular areas of human rights practice around the world. Mine focuses on freedom of opinion and expression, in particular centered on, though not limited by, Article 19 of both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Special rapporteurs or independent experts or working groups that are part of uh, the Human Rights Council system do a range of things, but core to our work are efforts to identify violations of human rights law to governments, conduct fact-finding and reporting both in-country and, uh, and remotely, and do studies on normative issues and implementation. What that translates into are allegation letters, legislative analyses, and urgent appeals that we direct to governments, which are first confidential but become public before each session of the Human Rights Council, which meets three times a year. Also includes official country visits. Um, and then, of course, thematic reports, both to the Human Rights Council and to the UN General Assembly, which I do uh, to each once a year. So for much of this work, I rely on the support of human rights officers at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and students in my clinic at UCI Law, but also, really importantly, an extensive network of NGOs around the world, both international and domestic grassroots organizations, uh, which are really in all regions of the world. So now moving uh, toward uh, encryption and human rights online, I think it's fair to say that Frank LaRue, my predecessor, laid the foundation for work on freedom of expression online with reports focused generally on freedom on the internet and surveillance in 2011 and 2013. So we were, we were really primed to continue and deepen that focus. We got a nudge, uh, I think as we all did in a way, from the US and UK governments last fall. Um, and I'm sure you've been talking quite a bit about this already, but of course, um, the directors of the FBI and GCHQ last September, October, uh, began to talk uh, in what seemed to be a kind of coordinated way about how encryption was a tool for terrorists and pedophiles and other criminals, bringing back government arguments from the crypto wars, um, footnote here, the history of which uh, has been really well told by OTIs, Kevin Bankston and Danielle Keel, and that helped me a lot in my understanding leading up to, to the report. So we began to do some research ourselves, canvassing civil society to try to understand how activists, journalists, and others use the tools of encryption and anonymity and it was clear that we needed in this process uh, to go beyond encryption and to, uh, to study anonymity as well. What we found, again, this is sort of our pre-study work. Um, this was our, um, in, in basically anecdotes. Uh, we found what wouldn't surprise anyone in the room, namely that the tools of encryption and anonymity added value and sometimes were absolutely critical to communicating or working in private. This was clearly the case with respect to journalists, activists, and a range of others who simply needed uh, privacy in order to enjoy their freedom of opinion and expression. And so we delighted, decided to launch our study and we solicited input from governments and civil society. We ended up with over 30 submissions from civil society, that is international and national and regional NGOs around the world, about 20 submissions from governments, including the United States, and those submissions can be found on the OHCHR report website. We held an experts meeting in Geneva that brought together technologists, academics, activists, um, including many, many names 
uh, that you would recognize, uh, including at least among the people who I think are in the room, Peter Misek of Access and Sarah McCune of Citizen Lab, uh, and about 25 other really brilliant people. And it was a, an essential part of our process of putting together the report. OK, so let me move to the report itself. Um, in short, the report presents a human rights legal framework for assessing encryption and anonymity. It's not a report that is specifically about privacy under Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. Um, that's also an area that I'm sure we'll focus, um, we'll get some focus uh, in the coming year or so because the Human Rights Council recently created um, a new position of special rapporteur on the right to privacy and that person was just appointed a couple of weeks ago. Instead, though, this report focuses on Article 19 in particular, which guarantees first, in its first paragraph, everyone's right to hold an opinion uh, without interference. It's not subject uh, to any restriction. That is the right to hold an opinion. Um, and second, it guarantees everyone's right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds uh, through any kind of media and regardless of frontiers. Um, to the extent that the report is actually about privacy, the report deals with privacy restrictions that interfere with the rights to freedom of opinion and expression. And so we use Article 19 um, essentially as the touchstone for analyzing encryption and anonymity. Now, of course, Article 19 isn't only about enjoyment of the right. Um, governments, as I said, may not limit uh, the right to hold an opinion. Um, but Article 19, paragraph 3, provides for narrow limitations on expression so long as they are provided by law in pursuit of a legitimate objective such as public order, the rights or reputations of others, or national security, and are necessary and proportionate to achieve that objective. This three-part test enjoys what I think is a broad international consensus as a matter of law, uh, practice and implementation, of course, are another story, particularly as national security excuses have tended to swallow the protections in some places almost entirely. Um, it is, however, difficult legally and practically to challenge assertions of national security on their face. And so as a result, much of the international debate, I think, is around the necessary and proportionate standard, which in effect susses out uh, the legitimacy of the assertion of national security or public order or any other legitimate objective. And we found in our report that most of the restrictions or bans on encryption and anonymity fail to meet the test of, nece of necessity and proportionality. The report goes through necessity and proportionality to some extent, but I would also encourage people to look at, ne at necessaryandproportionate.org, which um, uh, includes the principles of necessity and proportionality and access uh, was very much a part of making that happen. So with that, I wanna highlight a handful of the, the report's observations or, or conclusions. So first, the report focuses very much on what I think is a consensus understanding of the terms of Article 19 and simply applies those terms in the context of digital technologies. But one area where there's quite limited work, academic or jurisprudential, is the protection of the right to hold opinions without interference. Going all the way back to the negotiating history of the ICCPR, it seems uh, that governments simply believed that, of course, nobody could interfere with what's inside your head. I thought there was a John Malkovich joke in there, but my daughter told me not to make it. Um, <laughs> the report tries to encourage advocates, governments, and courts to think about how we hold our opinions in a digital age in which so much of our opinion and our work product is held digitally and in which so many civil society groups and activists, as, as Citizen Lab has pointed out in its really excellent research on this point, so many are subject to digital attack specifically because of their opinions and their research. Second, in the US and UK, there's obvious concern about FBI, NSA, GCHQ weakening encryption standards. And I think that's probably been a big part of the discussion today. Um, or in the case of the UK, banning certain encryption apps altogether, although there's a story in Business Insider today that suggests the UK is, or at least number 10, is, is uh, pulling back from that. Not, not so clear. Of course, as much as what we do here implicates 
and influences what others do globally, I think we need to think beyond our own particular context in the US and UK. We live in a world in which mass and targeted surveillance, digital attacks on individuals and civil society, harassment of members of vulnerable groups, and a wide variety of digital opinion and expression result in serious repercussions, including detention, physical attacks, and even killings. We also live in a world of massive blocking, throttling, and filtering of the internet, denying individuals the right of access to information, regardless of frontiers, as guaranteed by human rights law. And given that so much of our expression today is in digital space, these security tools must be seen as being at the heart of opinion and expression in a digital age. That's what the report argues, um, essentially. Now, the report recognizes that many governments are legitimately concerned that they have the obligation not only to respect, promote, and protect, and protect the right to freedom of opinion and expression, but they also have the obligation to protect the right to life. There's no question about that. However, the report concluded that laws, practices, and policies that either ban, restrict, or otherwise undermine encryption and anonymity, all in the name of public order or counterterrorism, do significant and I believe disproportionate damage to the freedom of expression. They do so, moreover, in an area of, uh, in an age of vast, previously unimaginable powers of surveillance, which Peter Swire has, uh, has really uh, covered um, brilliantly, um, and that even without access to encrypted data, uh, the world is uh, an expanded capacity of governmental security apparat apparatuses everywhere. We see that uh, as a matter of, of the reality of today's uh, surveillance. Third, the report highlights examples in which states have not restricted the individual use of encryption or anonymity tools. Now, admittedly, it's not a huge number, but the report strongly recommends that states follow this practice and comprehensively protect the use of these tools. The report also recommends that states not only protect encryption and anonymity, but also promote their use as a matter of digital security. Fourth, though the report does not deal extensively with the corporate sector, um, which we will be doing uh, in a project that we expect to launch later this fall. Uh, it's also, the report also recommends that corporate actors include encryption in their products by design and default. Now, related to this, the report agrees with the view that compelling private industry, so we're getting to the issue of backdoors, that compelling private industry to install encryption vulnerabilities for government access will undermine everyone's security against criminal activity or hostile state action. And as such, backdoors, golden keys, key escrows, you know, the tools of the vulnerability trade are disproportionate responses to crime and terrorism. And this report strongly recommends against them. Fifth, I'm getting to the end of this list, where states do legitimately need access to encrypted or anonymous information, the report recommends strongly that governments only seek such access through judicial process, according to regular legal rules and procedures, and targeted on specific individuals or data. Finally, it may not come as a surprise to anyone, but the UN itself has to improve its own digital security. Its websites are generally not encrypted, so individuals around the world, particularly those at risk, are unable to reach the UN in a secure way. And that has to change, particularly among the human rights mechanisms, if these are going to be safe spaces for those at risk. So there's more that I could say, um, but I'll leave it at that and say a few words about government responses when I presented the report in June, and then, um, and then bring it to a conclusion. OK, so how did governments respond? Um, so based on the presentation in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, where governments intervened in what's um, not ironically called an interactive dialogue. Um, they, I think I could divide up the responses uh, as follows, or at least give a little flavor of the responses. I think the boosters for the report, those who found the report compelling or agreed with it or whatever, um, included many but not all governments in the European Union. Also Brazil, of course, which has been a leader in the UN system around these kinds of issues. Um, Benin actually uh, came strongly in support, uh, and several others. And I would actually especially highlight the government of Norway, uh, which has been a strong supporter of this, um, of the report's approach. 
The opponents made some interesting points. Um, some of the five eyes uh, intervened in strong opposition to the report, as you might imagine. Uh, New Zealand and Australia saw my argument as focused on privacy, which, uh, as I described, it's not. Um, but either way, from a later intervention, I understand um, that they are pretty firmly opposed to the report's conclusions, at least uh, one of the delegates from New Zealand uh, who called the report outrageously bad, um, which is, I guess, some, some stamp of approval or disapproval, depending on how you see them. Um, the Russian Federation delegate was surprised by what he called an artificial and inappropriate focus on digital security, um, and uh, instead asked that I focus on, UN, uh, on Ukraine's attack on uh, the mass media. Uh, and China called the report false and inconsistent with its approach of, quote, management of the internet, end quote. Uh, the Organization of Islamic States, uh, of Islamic countries, the OIC, and its members um, didn't come out uh, particularly focus on encryption or anonymity specifically, although many of uh, the member countries of the OIC um, either ban or strictly limit encryption and anonymity, um, but they were generally focused to some extent on the pr uh, protection of vulnerable groups and argued that governments had to protect first and foremost against hate online. As for the United States, um, you know, I think the view is somewhat, at least as mediated in the UN system uh, was somewhat complicated by an interagency process that both promotes and resists digital security. The US government, as probably everyone in the room knows, uh, has long supported strong encryption and censorship circumvention tools such as Tor, and it's given, it has given millions of dollars in support of digital activists around the world. Given the FBI and NSA positions, um, there's clearly some internal dissonance, uh, which is still playing out. But for my part, I would emphasize that I've enjoyed tremendous cooperation from and engagement with the US team that's focused on human rights and international organizations, both in Washington and Geneva. Uh, and, um, and the US team has really been a big supporter and active player in the Freedom Online Coalition and in other, um, and in Internet Governance Forum and other places where, um, where their role really is, is quite um, essential. So to close, I, I want to urge just a, a couple or a few suggestions for moving forward. Um, and in some, in some respect, these are requests. Um, so first, I hope that activists and advocates and academics review the report, make use of its findings, challenge its conclusions where necessary so that there can be you know, vigorous debate around it. I'll be out there trying to call attention to this area where security in the digital age strongly implicates freedom of opinion and expression. And I hope you are too. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will be out there as well. Second, uh, please be engaged using Access and other organizations like them as a model for research and advocacy worldwide. And don't focus only on my mandate or the privacy mandate, although that's, I think, quite important. The UN system enjoys a wide range of human rights and political mechanisms that benefit from civil society input and engagement, and it's crucial that everyone uh, be there um, whenever you can. And then finally, I would just say continue doing what you're doing, challenging the idea that online security for everyone is tantamount to providing a safe space or safe spaces for terrorists, pedophiles, and other criminals and use the language of human rights and free expression, which are, after all, among the core values of this country, uh, not simply human rights norms that might be out there for others. So with that, I'll conclude. And if we have time for q and I'd be happy to take some questions. And again, thanks to Access for, uh, for setting this all up. I David, this is Drew here. Can you hear me? I can. Great, so what, we do have time for a question or two. So I'm gonna just uh, see if we have any hands in the audience. Thanks David for you, you did a great job. And uh, I'm working with the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran. My name is Ali Akbar Mousavi. 
Uh, my question is that how do you uh, report this uh, great job to ITU, International Telecommunication Union, that uh, the countries like Iran are member of that uh, agent, I mean the um, entity that maybe has more influence to implement these suggestions that you uh, pointed out? Thank you. Drew, did you, were you collecting a couple of questions, at, or you want me to take one at a time? Sure, sure. Let's collect a couple. I think that that's a good idea. Same. Can we have? Do we have any other hands in the room? Uh, Joris van Hobo from the NYU. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you're planning in future work. You mentioned something in the report on future work, also focusing a bit more on business uh, and the role of business. And I was wondering if you, if you imagine also saying a little bit more on what business could do, could do with the deployment of crypto, since a lot of the di dynamics in this, uh, on the question of encryption is what are companies going to do, what are they going to deploy, and what are they not going to deploy? I think we should uh, start there and see, and see where okay. that takes us. Yeah, great. So um, those are two really great questions. Um, so the first question, um, on, on uh, the ITU, sort of taking the focus from Iran, I agree, the ITU is a place um, where, um, where we need to be. I think where civil society has had a, a little bit of harder time getting access to, um, but it, it's also a place of some risk, in part because the move against the, um, the existing multi-stakeholder approach in which civil society, governments, corporate actors, and others have a voice in, um, in sort of internet governance uh, is, is at some risk. And so I think we need to make sure that we're there at, um, at the ITU, um, that we're at the, at the IGF in Brazil. And I would really encourage as many people uh, as possible to go to IGF uh, later, um, later in November. Um, I think that, that really heading off the efforts uh, of moving internet governance to a more government-focused approach uh, has to be among uh, civil societies and governments' uh, top priorities in the coming years. Um, and we're going to be doing some work around that. So as, as I said in the introduction, uh, we do thematic reporting, and uh, we have a, a kind of a working list of thematic reports for the next two or three years. Uh, and. Uh, and one of those thematic areas will certainly be internet governance and really focusing on maintaining the, um, the internet, uh, the human rights language and the human rights multi-stakeholder approach as part of the, the internet governance model that, that currently exists. So I hope that's, that's somewhat responsive, um, responsive to, the, to that question. On the issue of uh, business and human rights, um, so, as I, as I mentioned, we're launching a, a project starting in the fall uh, that will be a multi-year project that's, focused, that's going to focus on corporate responsibility, but not just corporate responsibility, and, but looking generally at the role of the corporate sector um, in, um, in internet regulation and in the whole range of issues that, um, that involve the corporate sector, which is really everything. I mean, when we think about it, you know, all of our free, all of our expression, or so much of our expression these days, is is taking place in this essentially private space uh, that we treat as public, and we're asking corporate actors to do quite a bit. We're asking them to take down offensive conduct, uh, um, offensive uh, material content. Um, we're in the European Union asking them to remove uh, material that might be. Um, uh, no longer relevant, the right to be forgotten issues. There's a whole lot of space right now that deserves the attention of the human rights framework. And so what we'll be doing is bringing together people over the next couple of years um, for both conferences, but also our end goal will be something like um, a specific ICT sector version of the RUGI principles, and um, which are the RUGI principles on business and human rights, which I know the questioner is really familiar with. Um, and I think that we have a lot to build on. There's the Global Network Initiative, GNI. There's the, um, the uh, 
telecom dialogue. I know uh, from Access, because I just received today, there's the Vodafone um, principles, Vodafone group principles. There's a lot out there um, that we can build upon, that we can challenge. We'll also be doing um, corporate visits. So as opposed to only doing country visits, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to, over the next couple of years, actually visit uh, corporate actors, not just in the United States, but around the world. Hopefully, you know, even, you know, visiting places like Weibo and Baidu and others to really get a sense of how corporate actors in all sorts of environments are, um, are working. So that's, I would put as, as one of the top three or four priorities, certainly in the digital space for, for the mandate over the next couple of years. David, we do have time for one more question, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So I'm actually gonna shoot it to one of the, a member of the Access team. Hey, David, this is Peter. Um, Hi, Peter. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I yeah, just encourage everyone to read your report. Um, and I wonder if you could just let us know the next steps in, in that report's lifespan and um, how we might use it um, for advocacy here uh, in the US in the midst of this heated debate. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks for that question. So with the, I, I would say, I mean, there's a couple of things that, um, as far as the lifespan goes, you know, most of these reports, nobody will be surprised at this, most of these reports uh, go up online, we have this so-called interactive dialogue in Geneva, and that's it. And I think it would be really unfortunate, I mean, of course I would say this, um, if the report um, only lives that kind of life. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, I'll be out there, I'm happy to, to you know, talk to groups to, we, we're actually starting a new project where um, working with a law firm in, in Los Angeles, um, where we're engaging as amicus in regional courts and elsewhere, you know, where advocates think that the report might have some value, you know, I would encourage you to use them. Now, of course, in the United States, it's not like the first thing that advocates reach for is the human rights toolbox, but you know, maybe over time we can change that and using the arguments in the report to the extent that you agree with them, um, you know, I would encourage you to use them in your own advocacy. If, if nobody's using them, then, then the report itself uh, won't have that, that kind of uh, life. So I guess that's, that's what I would say in terms of the, the, the life of the report. It, it doesn't have an independent existence. It, it only exists. Now, this is getting deep and metaphysical, I guess. It only exists to the extent that people make use of it, and so I would encourage people to make use of it. I mean, I would say just as a footnote here, um, or not so much a footnote, but as, a, as kind of as we move forward. So as I mentioned, I report to the Human Rights Council, but also, as you know, Peter, to the General Assembly, um, which I'll be doing in October. That report is going to be focused on the protection of sources, which is journalistic sources, but also other kinds of sources. And, um, and the protection of whistleblowers, all under the, the general rubric of um, the right of access to information, the right to information. Clearly, encryption and anonymity play a role in protection of sources and whistleblowers. And we'll be you know, hearkening back to this report as we work on our next report. Um, but I would also just use this opportunity to encourage anybody in the room who's focused on those issues to get in touch and if you want to share any information or perspective to share it with us now, because we're actually in the process of drafting and we'll be doing that over the next three weeks or so. Great, thanks so much, David. Appreciate it. Thanks. So our next guest, uh, Representative Zoe Lofgren, unfortunately could not be here today uh, due to impending votes in Congress. And so she has instead sent us a video and I will be introducing that video. Um, so I'll keep the intro super short. Uh, Representative Lofgren does things for internets. And she's the only member of Congress, uh, to my knowledge, with an affirmative internet freedom agenda uh, that encompasses reforming government surveillance, copyright, patents, uh, wireless taxes, computer crime, and internet governance, all with an eye towards protecting individual liberties and driving innovation. 
And at this point, Representative's past leadership in opposition to SOPA is the stuff of legends. As Congress was considering whether to ruin the internet as we know it, uh, she issued a rallying cry to web users saying to melt down the phone lines in Congress. Uh, Do not underestimate the power that you have, she said. And she was right about that power, if only we wielded it more frequently. And now more recently, Representative Lofgren is the lead co-sponsor uh, of bipartisan legislation that would prohibit government agencies from compelling go- uh, companies to build back doors into their secure products and services. And this legislation actually passed the House overwhelmingly in 2014, and it's now back again with her colleagues, Representatives Massey and Sensenbrenner. Uh, so Representative Lo- Lofgren is in fact on the front lines of protecting strong encryption in Congress. And can I say also that as her legislative counsel from 2012 to 2014, Representative Lofgren is in fact an ideal boss. She's thoughtful, incisive, and considerate. And I learned a tremendous amount just by watching her operate in masterful fashion. So many people in the room already know that technology and security are nearing an inflection point. And the norms, the policies, the standards that we impose today will have a profound effect on our future. And Representative Lofgren, if you're watching this, Thank you very much for all that you do, and please consent to have yourself cloned as soon as possible. So let's hit the video. Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, I want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of today's crypto summit. I plan to be there personally, but they've called votes uh, for the time that I was to be there. So uh, due to the miracle of modern communication, Uh, I'm happy to discuss this subject. You know, when I came into office in 1995, encryption was considered a controlled munition, and it was illegal to export encryption using keys larger than 56 bits. I worked with uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte uh, to allow export of off-the-shelf crypto devices uh, and and banned mandatory key escrow for encryption uh, products. And you know, I to illustrate how weak uh, 56-bit DES encryption was, by 1999, the Electric Frontier Foundation was able to break it in less than 24 hours. When Bob and I uh, worked together in 95, 96, 97, we would go uh, to members on the floor and talk to them about encryption. And I can remember members saying, what is it? What is encryption? And having to explain not only digital, but also analog. Uh, But ultimately, uh, members of Congress and President Clinton uh, successfully rolled back uh, the export restrictions through an executive order, and encryption greater than 56-bit was finally allowed to be exported uh, by the year 2000. I remember very well at the RSA conference where uh, Bob and I pressed the button for the first export of uh, encryption that was not illegal. Now, encryption has allowed not only privacy and free speech to flourish, but commerce as well. And that's why it is so troubling that all of these life-changing benefits could be gone in an instant if widespread systematic weaknesses ever caused people to stop trusting the security of the internet and our electronic devices. The leaks by Edward Snowden not only revealed that the government was collecting substantially more data on Americans than anyone had been led to believe, but it also showed how broken the security of every web service, computer, or mobile device on the planet really was. It's important to remember that that the response by companies to boost their security and privacy protections wasn't because the US government was breaking the law. It was because the systematic weaknesses the US government was using could be exploited by anyone, including bad actors. This fear shook the internet to its very core. And between this revelation and the recent major cybersecurity breaches, a crisis of trust was starting to look like a real possibility. It was in this environment that I worked with Representative Thomas Massey to ban government agencies from making requests or demands that a private entity alter their system in any way that allows the circumvention of these protections. Even if a backdoor is created with the best of intentions, 
and let's arguably say that that is possible, it's only a matter of time before a hacker finds and exploits it. Such flaws put the data security of every person and business using the Internet at risk. Our government should strengthen the technology that protects our privacy, not take advantage of it. Now, this is not a theoretical concern. The NSA leaks reveal that the NSA paid a private entity, likely without that entity's knowledge, to include a flawed encryption scheme as the default implementation. And the FBI has been publicly putting pressure on messaging platforms to introduce backdoors into their information systems to allow for the decryption of private messages. Now, fortunately, the House of Representatives has spoken clearly on this issue twice, that intelligence agencies should not even be permitted to ask for surveillance backdoors in technology products and services, let alone force every American business to provide backdoors as the FBI Director uh, Comey would prefer. Tech's leading cryptologists, organizations, companies have all made clear to the government this sort of secure encryption backdoor is not only technologically unfeasible, it puts the data security of everyone on the Internet at risk. Now, I find it troubling in the wake of the biggest government hack ever at OPM that the intelligence community is now asking for the keys to the contents of every single person's private communications and data, effectively making irresistible targets for malicious hackers. If history has taught us anything, it's that there is no such thing as an impenetrable network, even for the most security-oriented companies. Uh, in 2011, RSA was hacked, uh, hacked by China, and it compromised nearly everyone uh, who had one of their secure ID tokens. The NSA leak revealed that British and American intelligence in 2010 hacked the largest manufacturer of SIM cards in the world, stealing encryption keys used by millions of cell phones around the world. And more recently, the Italian private surveillance company hacking team was hacked and consequently confidential information and valuable zero-day exploits were stolen and spread around the Internet. It should also humble us that a number of flaws have been found in the lawful wiretap access built into telephone and internet equipment as required by CALEA, something I've never supported, by the way. The NSA determined in 2011 that there were security problems with every telephone switch it tested that was built to comply with CALEA to provide access for wiretapping. Now, the tenor of the recent debate over backdoor encryption reminded me of the clipper chip when 20 years ago, law enforcement came to Congress with warnings of going dark and being helpless in the post-encryption age. What resulted was the clipper chip, an encryption device that would encrypt telephone communications but allow the government to decrypt these communications through the use of a master key held in escrow. This proposal was wildly crit criticized. It was criticized as un unworkable. Uh, criticized as a threat to security in a study released by some of the most respected minds in computer security. Now, fortunately, due to these failings, the clipper chip was never adopted. The recent push by the FBI and DOJ for encryption backdoors once again has been spurned by these experts. They have once again released an updated report just last week reaffirming that a key escrow system that provides sufficient security is simply unworkable. It's not doable. These experts conclude that requiring any form of excep exceptional access would, quote, force a U-turn from the best practices now being deployed to make the Internet more secure, and that's the end of the quote. One of those best practices is, quote, forward secrecy, where decryption keys are deleted immediately after use so that stealing the encryption key used by a communication server would not compromise earlier or later communications. Further, they conclude that the increased complexity required by a key escrow system inevitably leads to more weak points to exploit, writing that complexity is the enemy of security 
every new feature can interact with others to create vulnerabilities. Now, you don't need to be a computer security expert to know that the more moving parts you have, the more weak links there are to break. Finally, even if such a system were possible, requiring backdoors completely ignores the reality of open source software in which it would be impossible to enforce a backdoor mandate without making it a crime to use such software, a scenario which leaves access to secure encryption to criminals only. Even more concerning, requiring backdoors completely ignores the future of cryptography and privacy. Two weeks ago, MIT released a white paper on its Enigma platform, a decentralized distributed data mining platform that can perform analysis and computation on encrypted data without ever decrypting it. In other words, you can securely send your private encrypted data to the cloud for processing and get a result back without anyone but you knowing what the data was sent. This opens up a whole new world of innovative uses for the cloud. Businesses being able to trust their most valuable data to be secretly and securely processed by a third party, allowing targeted advertising without ever knowing what websites a user visits, secure scanning of communications for malware or phishing attacks without ever reading the message, or even a search engine that can return results without ever knowing what search string you entered. And while there are limitations to the MIT proposal, it's just the first step towards cryptographically secure computation. But it's important to remember that requiring backdoors and encryption software not only hinders these potential innovations, it destroys the very benefits they offer. Of all the countries in the world, ours is the most dependent on the internet and the devices that connect to it. This means that we're also more vulnerable than any other country in the world to cybersecurity weaknesses and attacks. That's why ensuring that privacy and security of Americans' data is a top priority of mine. This isn't the first time that the government has attempted to legislate or mandate the impossible because it doesn't understand how technology works. It will take experts and engineers to patiently educate supporters of weakening encryption on the full repercussions of their proposals. I thank you again for letting me uh, visit with you this afternoon. I wish I could be there with you personally, uh, but I commend you for this discussion. We're going to need to work together as this proceeds because I see a big fight ahead of us. So that's our show. Um, just a few quick comments, and then I'm going to release you out um, into our cocktail hours. Um, first, I want to thank our sponsors, Google, the Software Alliance, Microsoft, and LinkedIn. Without them, we couldn't have had you here today. Thank you so much. I want to thank Andrew Fetterman, who was responsible for the amazing live graphics that you saw throughout the day. I want to thank the members of the press for coming and for covering this conference and this very important topic and for taking this issue out to the public. Without you, a lot of the work we do would get lost. I want to really thank every single one of the speakers who came today um, and who spoke and who took the time out of their incredibly busy schedules to talk to all of you, to talk to our numerous remote viewers from around the world, and to really kind of collaborate on moving us forward on this important topic. Thank you so, so much. Um, a few just last things. One last thank you to all of the members of the Access staff. Can you guys stand up one more time? I work with the most incredible people who really work tirelessly and without compromising any of their points of view all of the time. Um, and I am so grateful to work with all of you. To our leader, Brett, in the back of the room, thank you so much for, for allowing us to do the work we do. To Eric Lavecchio, who has managed this entire conference over here silently. I know he's going to be incredibly mad at me for calling him out, but thank you, Eric, for making sure it ran. And finally, to all of you for coming and for participating and tweeting and talking and asking questions. 
We really appreciate you coming out and joining us. Um, we now have uh, hors d'oeuvres and cocktails, cocct or crypto themed cocktails out in the reception area. And Andrew Crocker from EFF is going to present some short stories that were submitted to us on what the future under crypto policy may or may not look like. Um, so thank you, Andrew, and I'll see you all outside. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.